When a piece of artwork ages well, it can end up encompassing a moment in time full of anticipation, rage and anxiety about the future. Hi and welcome back to If Looks Could Kill, where we analyse independent and experimental art house. Today we will be talking about the Doom Generation from 1995. As always, this video will feature spoilers, so tune out now and watch the film for yourself if you wish. This occasionally comedic, dramatic thriller stars James Duvall, Rose McGowan, Jonathan Schack, and is directed by Gregor Rocky. This film is the second entry in Gregor Rocky's Apocalypse trilogy. The other entries are Totally Fucked Up from 93 and Nowhere from 97. This film begins with Jordan White and Amy Blue, played by Duvall and McGowan, who rescue a new drifter called Xavier Red from an attack one night in an LA car park. The three newly acquainted runaways go on a journey throughout the areas of urban sprawl within Los Angeles. With that description, you might think this movie is an overly dramatic and pretentious portrayal of troubled youth of America, and whilst there are elements of that in this film, this film has a whimsical feel to it and a flair of fantasy that is prevalent throughout. The dialogue between the three main outcasts is witty, comedic and full of angst-filled microaggressions. In her first real acting gig, Rose McGowan delivers one of the film's best performances of the pessimistic, rage-filled and unhinged Amy Blue. The relationship between Amy Blue and Jordan White is one of the film's greatest attributes because of how tragically codependent they are to one another. Jordan White is the dense stoner boyfriend of Amy Blue who suffers an identity crisis and becomes confused once the arrival of the third entry to their group Xavier Red shows up. Xavier Red is the hitchhiker they rescue and is the most edgy, thrill seeking and borderline psychopathic of all three friends. One central feeling that this film has and showcases throughout nearly its entirety is how the events and timeline are heading towards some kind of tragic conclusion and definite end for the characters, hence this being a part of Gregor Aki's Apocalypse trilogy. All of the characters seem extremely pessimistic and nihilistic as if they are awaiting and expecting tragedy to bestow itself onto them after a certain short length of time. Kind of linking with this idea, another background theme that constantly reintroduces itself is Hell or Satan appearing in all kinds of forms. The club scene that the movie opens up to has a background of heavy metal and a blazing fire with the cutout of the words Welcome to Hell written on it. Every time a numerical figure is mentioned, it always has something to do with 666 such as the price of cigarettes being $6.66 or something like that. I mentioned this film's fantasy element earlier on and the reason I mentioned this is because a few things that happen that don't seem real or feel like kind of a hallucination. For example, early on there is a scene in a petrol station where two characters approach the cash register to pay and they realise they've left their wallets in the car. They get into a physical brawl with the shop owner once he accuses them of trying to steal and they end up shooting the head off this man and his severed head still utters speech despite it being decapitated. Obviously this scene pulls the film's scope out of realism early on and leaves the audience wondering will the film just be pure fantasy from now on. I think the film dips in and out of the dreamlike quality and this just adds a sense of originality and uniqueness that was quite accomplished for 1995. Like a lot of Greg Araki's films, this one deals with the exploration of sexuality. This is kind of a background thought for the first half of the film, but is pushed to the forefront towards the end of the film's climax. The boyfriend character, Jordan White, says and does a lot of things that point towards the direction of him being a closeted homosexual, especially in one of the opening scenes when he and Amy attempt to have sex and he can't, and he blames it on him being afraid of catching AIDS. Throughout the film, all three characters express and have sexual tension between one another, this all points in the direction of the one scene that the film is infamous for, which is the threesome scene that takes place towards the end. The second to last scene is an unexpected moment of terror that comes out of left field. The three characters are attacked after being hunted down in the barn they are staying in, and a few things happen that enforce consequential and discriminatory results for their behaviour. Amy Blue's character is raped on an American flag, and the image of this alone has a lot of obvious meaning behind it and Jordan White is tormented and finally castrated with a pair of shears. Two of the characters, Amy Blue and Xavier Red, survive the attack and drive off into the sunset as the movie comes to an end. It's an interesting choice to have the only one likeable character to be the one that's killed off, but in hindsight this just takes more of an emotional toll on the viewer. Upon the release of the Doom Generation, censorship boards were not kind to the final product and many edits were complete in order to release the film with an R rating. The more common version that is available out there is the cut down version and there is a warning that appears in text basically suggesting to the viewer that they go watch the director's cut instead. 
The scenes that were cut were a few details and small chunks as well as bigger portions towards the ending that ended up being left on the cutting room floor. Generally when it was released to the public audiences had mixed receptions all around but that is kind of what you'd expect with this film especially one with Greg Araki style. One thing I've noticed about this film and others by Araki is that he has a lot of thoughts and ideas about certain themes but doesn't go too deeply and explore them. A lot of the times he'll just present something to the audience and let them think about it and I think he does this in order to provoke and shock the audience as well as make them think. When I watch this film, certain things that Rose McGowan has to do makes me slightly uncomfortable because I have read her book where she spoke about instances to do with the Me Too movement and the way she was treated on set and this does not sit well with me considering the context of a lot of the scenes. On a concluding note, The Doom Generation is an audacious and ironic portrayal of American youth in the mid 90s and a certain subculture that lived a wild and nihilistic lifestyle. Thank you guys so much for watching and listening to my thoughts on the Doom Generation. Please subscribe and tune in for more videos like this coming very shortly. Thank you.